All right, Kathy and David at the back of the room. Is this a good volume? Everybody, if you can't hear me, raise your hand. <laughs> I'd love to say that. <laughs> I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from my book. So glad to see you all here. I guess I should say hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And then after that, we'll have about five questions. So if you've got any questions, get them saved up. Here they come. <laughs> about 20 minutes. And then I'll go out and sign. That'll be the procedure. Um, I won't be able to personalize because there's too many of you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> but I don't want the people in the back of the line waiting while I sign your name, you know. So I'm just going to sign my name. <laughs> And I'm not going to sign anything but the book. So if you brought all of your Rue McClanahan memorabilia, <laughs> I'll just get, touch it for you or something. Okay. I'm going to read you first from the very, towards the very end of the book. Because we are in a hospital and this might be relevant to some of you. If I could move this here a little bit closer to the mic. There. One May morning in Hidden Hills, California, Barbara Lawrence, my manager, sent me the script for Millions of Miles, a play about an over-the-hill prostitute and a shy widower living in Queens, to be presented in a small theater north of Manhattan it wasn't very good, but I was interested in the role of the prostitute and wanted to work on her. <laughs> I talked it over with Barbara. You want to disappear for a couple of months, she said. Heck, I said, sure, and we accepted it. The frugal producers rented quarters for me in a funny old theatrical apartment hotel in the West 40s. I checked in, saw a couple of plays, reported for rehearsals on May 19th, where I met the director. By the way, I should tell you that this was in 1997. Where I met the director, the husband and wife producers, the stage manager, the leading man, the playwright, and two younger actors who rounded out the cast. Excuse me. Nobody else, no assistants. The stage manager was also the costume department, a minuscule budget, to say the least. On the third day of rehearsals, I was returning from getting coffee when I saw a tall, slender man in a blue blazer talking to the director and producers. And kids, that was one good-looking dude. <laughs> Thick, wavy brown hair, big hazel eyes, full lips, quick to smile. Rue, Barry said, meet Morrow Wilson. And Morrow Wilson shook my hand and said in a low, mellifluous voice, I saw you play Catelyn in Dylan, and you've never disappointed me since. How refreshing. Catelyn in Dylan in 1972. <laughs> One of my favorite roles, not a word about the Golden Girls. <laughs> Mr. Wilson stayed for the full day of rehearsals, but I was never told why he was there. Next day he returned, watched rehearsals, and had several little private conversations with Barry and Joel, the stage manager. Was he a possible investor, a play doctor, just an interested friend? It turned out he was there to give any assistance he could, gratis, as a favor to his friends, Barry Nelson and his wife Nancy, Barry being the director. At the close of rehearsal the second day, I announced to the room in general, oh gosh, I'll just never get all these lines learned without some help. Is there anyone here who could cue me for about an hour before rehearsals? <laughs> After a moment, Mara Wilson said, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> the next morning, Mara arrived at my apartment at 9.30 sharp, as dapperly dressed as he had been at the theater the day before, and I knew I was going to like him right away when he candidly asked, so, 
how did you get stuck to this tar baby? <laughs> I laughed and said, oh, I thought the role had possibilities. <laughs> how about you? God, I loved the zingy way he talked, the silver-tongued devil, and it was heartening to meet someone who felt the way I do about keeping one's promises. He had promised Barry that if he ever needed any help, he'd be glad to help him. And Barry called him and said, I need help. And here he came. We eventually got around to running lines, but over the next several days, sitting with Maro every morning, I started getting a lot more interested in the character on the sofa beside me than I was in the characters in the play. He was funny. No, witty. He had a gargantuan vocabulary with which he spun interesting stories and raised thought-provoking questions. He had integrity and was decent in the rarest sense of that word. He could argue anyone into the ground and enjoyed verbal confrontations, but he never swore, never used four-letter words. He had more information in his head than any cranium should have been able to hold. He remembered every joke, every song, every piece of pertinent information he'd ever passed his eyes over able to quote someone famous on any subject, but when I said something about his impressive intellect, he pointedly told me, I am not an intellectual. Well, I thought, that's how much you know. <laughs> I found the lump while I was getting a massage one night. Those of you, and there are far too many, who have felt the lump know exactly what I'm talking about. The fingertips stray across it, tra-la-la and then return, I beg your pardon, and then palpate, what the hell, and then grope, oh my God. The lump, meanwhile, just sits there like a lump. Uh, it's under my right arm, and I didn't know who else to call tomorrow. I said, I don't have a regular doctor here. Can you suggest someone? He said, I do know someone, Dr. Stephen Field. I'll make an appointment right away. The next day I had rehearsals upstate where the play was due to open in a week, so he made the appointment for the following day, Friday, June 6th, 9 a.m. When I arrived, Morrow was waiting on the sidewalk outside Dr. Field's office. He opened the taxi door for me and gave me a firm, reassuring hug. But his expression was so solemn, his eyes so penetrating, I felt a twinge of anxiety. The examination was brief. It's breast cancer, said Dr. Field without a shred of doubt. The room, his voice in my head, that split second on the clock, everything seemed to slip off track, the whole world suddenly toppling. Breast cancer, I echoed, but I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> I exercise every day. I get regular mammograms, and in my family, no one in my family. Clearly he couldn't possibly be right because cancer is something that happens to other people right up until the moment that it happens to you. How long have you been on hormone replacement, he asked. Seventeen years. Well, there you go, he said. And there I went. The cancer is well into stage two. It's already metastasized to the lymph nodes. You'll need surgery right away. I struggled to assimilate the information he was giving me, grateful to know that a deeply concerned but comfortingly practical Morrow was waiting for me in the reception area. The person you need with you at an event like this is a producer, not a director. Someone who will take action instead of telling you how to feel. When I told Morrow the news, he took it in, showing no surprise or fear. I suspected as much, he nodded taking my hand. Rue, you've had so much work to do on this play. I wasn't going to say anything until after you'd opened, but now I want you to know that I love you. So whatever happens, I want to be with you over the long haul. The difference between the blackness of the examination room and the unfiltered sunlight of those words was almost too much. The thing I wanted to hear and the thing I most dreaded hearing had both landed in my lap in the space of 15 minutes. For the first time in my life, someone was there for me for, with exactly what I needed at the exact moment I needed it. I looked at Morrow and said, I love you too. 
Morrow helped me gather facts, weigh options, and weed out priorities. Dr. Larry Norton at Sloan Kettering was the only one who didn't want to do a single or double mastectomy right off the bat. I think we have a shot at a lumpectomy, he said. And if the borders are clean, we'll start you on a good stiff regimen of chemotherapy and radiation. The cancer's moving quickly, and so we have to move quickly, too. Morrow squeezed my hand, and I said, all right, let's get started. As plans for my treatment moved rapidly forward, the producers called me every morning, starting at 7, by the way, and then they'd call back at around 9, and then they'd call back at around noon, and then about 2 in the after well, anyway, you get the idea, telling me how much they loved me and how much they wanted me to do the play first and then get the surgery. <laughs> All heart, those two. One evening the following week, Morrow took me to see a revival of Chicago. Sitting there beside him in the dark theater, I discovered I wasn't in the mood for the old razzle-dazzle. As a matter of fact, I couldn't keep my eyes off him. I kept looking at him. He's looking at the stage. At the intermission, I said, let's leave. Let's go to Sardi's, he said, and have a glass of wine. We sat across the table from each other, and I still couldn't take my eyes off him. Over my second glass of red wine, I said to Morrow, I'd like to marry you. <laughs> Such an expression on his face. His eyes grew wide. Will you marry me? He said. Yes. After a moment, he said, Will you marry me? I said, yes. I guess he believed me because he didn't ask a third time. <laughs> We'd known each other two weeks and five days. Christmas Day, 1997, Morrow and I were married at the Waldorf Astoria between my sixth and seventh chemo treatments. Oh, man. I was bald as a billiard ball. Morrow had bronchitis and 102 fever. <laughs> The wedding was ridiculous, <laughs> and the honeymoon was worse. But I've been Mrs. Mara Wilson a lot longer than I was ever a Mrs. Anybody Else. <laughs> That's the story about that. And then, and then I just wanted to read a little bit about getting the role of Blanche. This is a shorter excerpt. When I, and this is all true. Now you just, this is true. This is the way it happened. Uh, a, a delivery car pulled up at my house. My agent had said, I'm sending a script over for you to look at. The guy came to the door and I went to the door and I got it and it's a manila folder and then you take the thing out of the manila folder, the script out. When I opened the bright yellow pilot script from NBC, a tingle ran up my spine, giving rise to a strong, immediate feeling. This one's a winner. I hadn't even opened it yet. The Golden Girls storyline concerns four women of a certain age joining up for financial reasons to share a house, but finding in each other the love and support of a family. I started reading, and I started laughing. The zingy, spot-on dialogue crackled like sparklers. I instantly loved these characters. Sophia, the nursing home escapee, <laughs> with outlandish tales of her Sicilian girlhood. Dorothy, the acerbic divorcee with a wisecrack for every occasion. Rose, the farm-fresh ninny, <laughs> with her sweetly guileless take on life. and. Oh la la, Blanche. <laughs> the Southern Miss with her free, joyful sexuality and sassiness. Here's a scene that takes place very early in the pilot script. It's between Blanche, Dorothy, and Rose. Blanche enters. Oh, Dorothy, can I borrow your mink stole? <laughs> it's Miami in June. <laughs> A 
only cats are wearing fur. <laughs> are you going out? <laughs> no. She's going to sit here where it's 112 degrees <laughs> and eat enchiladas. <laughs> I just need some cucumbers to put on my eyes. You'll have trouble seeing, Blanche. <laughs> oh, it's very good. It reduces puffiness. Does it work on thighs? <laughs> mm, I don't know, honey. I don't need it on my thighs. <laughs> I call my agent at once. Sylvia Rue, the script is definitely for me. I'm perfect for Blanche. Actually, they're thinking of Betty White for Blanche, she said. <laughs> they want you to read for Rose. <laughs> oh, God, Rose. <laughs> But I have no connection with Rose. <laughs> and I know exactly how to play Blanche. <laughs> well, she said, you can either go in tomorrow and read for Rose or pass. Oh, I read and reread the script, becoming more certain that Blanche and I were made for each other. Oh, dear. I went to NBC and read Rose for the pilot director, Jay Sandrich. And after a scene or two, he said, Rue, I know it's an unorthodox thing to ask, and you're not prepared, but would you mind going down the hall to an empty room and, and taking a look at the role of Blanche? <laughs> <laughs> Why, Jay, I cooed, my heart leaping. <laughs> I wouldn't mind one bit. <laughs> not prepared? Please. I'd all but memorized it. I went down the hall for a few minutes, then came back and gave Jay the full Blanche treatment. In high school, I had to break up with Carl Dugan, captain of the football team. I was very nervous, but I just spit it out. Carl, I'm dumping you for Coach Willens. <laughs> Next day, they asked Betty White to come in and read Rose opposite my Blanche. Caught by surprise, Betty gave Rose an absolutely hilarious interpretation with a childlike charm that was not your run-of-the-mill ninny. What a great day! <laughs> it's like life is a great big weenie roast and I'm the biggest weenie. Susan Harris, the creator of the series, called me later that day. Rue, we offered B. Arthur the role of Dorothy, but she turned it down. She said, do you think you could help persuade her? I hadn't seen B. in seven years. We didn't really stay in touch after Maud closed in 1978. But I loved working with her, and she was perfect for Dorothy. I was on the phone within minutes. B., can you tell me why you're not jumping at the best script to come along in 20 years? Because, Rue, <laughs> B replied, I don't want to do Maud and Vivian meet Sue Ann Nivens. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> no, B, I'm doing the sex pot, Blanche. Betty is the dimwit. <laughs> A pause, then, oh, really? Well, now that is interesting. Within a day or two, NBC had us three, along with Estelle Getty, who'd already been hired as Sophia, come in to read for the big suits. We read cold, no rehearsal, but the chemistry was plain as a preacher's daughter. We had those guys wetting their pants. <laughs> and bam, that afternoon it was settled. Like Rose says, Dorothy, you're the smart one. And Blanche, you're the sexy one, and Sophia, you're the old one, and I'm the nice one. Everybody always likes me. <laughs> to which Sophia replies, well, the old one isn't so crazy about you. <laughs> we taped the pilot, which had the audience inebriated with laughter, and were picked up by NBC for 13 episodes to begin taping in July. Sheer heaven. <laughs> That's the last of that excerpt. <laughs> have you been thinking about those questions? Anybody have a question? Oh, there's a lady with a question. Hi, I'm Avianca Kishti, and I'm a stay-at-home mom, and I pretend we're watching you every morning to fix an 
What I did on Broadway? Yes. Okay, I did uh, most recently, I did um, Wicked, the musical. I played Madame Marable. That was for seven months, uh, seven months and one week to be exact. Uh, what I'm going to do this fall, however, is I think more exciting. I'm going to be on a new show called Ryan's Life. And I play the grandmother of a 15-year-old boy named Ryan. It's on a new cable subscription channel called Here TV. It's just barely going now. They have a few things on, not many. But uh, we're hoping to get Ryan's Life on, which is their, their, their sitcom. They've got, um, you know, romantic dramas, um, detective stories, gothic horror stories. Probably not westerns. I don't think anyone's doing westerns. But our sitcom and all kinds of different shows. And they think that they're going to be on before the year is up. I certainly hope so. It's a gay channel. Isn't that interesting? And because it is, Ryan, who's only 15, it's, it's legal for them to write a story about a 15-year-old because it's, it's subscription. And uh, he's questioning his sexuality. One week he thinks he might be gay, and the next week he thinks he's probably straight, and the next week he thinks he might be gay, and he can't talk to anyone about it. He's very confused, except me, his grandmother. I'm liberal, I'm a, uh, I'm a widow, living with him and his family, my son and, and uh, his, his wife and kids, and the son's a Beverly Hills psychiatrist who's just as uptight as you can get. <laughs> And Ryan can't talk to him. So I am this delicious, funny character. My first entrance in the first script, we're going to do six right away. My first entrance, we're all going out to a Prince concert. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, I kind of like him, to tell you the truth. I uh, saw so him in the Super Bowl, you know? First time I ever saw him. He's pretty good. <laughs> well, anyhow, we're going out to a Prince concert, and we're coming down the stairs on our way out the door. Uh, Ryan is at, staying at home to study with his girlfriend. And my first line is, are my tits straight? <laughs> I say, maiden form bra my ass. So I thought, she'll be fun to play. She'll be a bit outspoken, but she'll be fun to play. But she's a very warm-hearted and understanding woman, you know. So that's what I'm planning to do this fall. Meanwhile, I'm writing a musical called Cobra Island. And um, it's a musical, what can I tell you? It's set in 1931 on a South Sea island, and it's about a, it's about a um, uh, princess who throws virgins into the volcano. <laughs> Little comedy. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, right back there. Compared to radiation. Um, the chemo made me sick as a dog. Sick as a dog. I had eight of them. ATC. Mm -hmm. So that the first four were relatively benign to get over. In fact, I, I kept working. I kept doing, I was in Oklahoma, down in North Carolina. But the last four, which of course is when I got married, those were those four hour drips. And they were three weeks apart, and um, they made me terribly, terribly sick. After that, I had six weeks of uh, radiation. And the radiation, I didn't feel any um, uh, um, reaction to. I didn't feel any reaction to. It was extremely painful getting ready for it, you know, getting all fixed to where 
all those tests I had to go through where they got everything all zeroed in so that once I was going to have it done, it would be just where you wanted it. Well, that was painful as hell. But once we started the radiation, I had no, I had no noticeable... Um, I went out and did a, a Peter Falk show, whatever that show's called. Went out and did a special with him during the radiation. And uh, I was weak, but I was weak from the chemo by then, you know, really weak. Um, and I didn't notice that I got any weaker from the radiation. I guess it must be different with everybody. Does that answer your question? Did it? The term radiation scares people? It scares people? Radiation. Well, it doesn't mean radioactive, exactly. I mean, you can radiate good health, too. You know? <laughs> and I just felt that I was going to do everything that I could to get rid of the cancer, whatever it took, you know, if you take a positive attitude. Yeah, there was another one right back there on the back row. Let me see if I understood you correctly. Did you say the view is looking for a new host? That's not my kind of thing. First of all, I hate arguing. And um, I don't want to do a daily show of any kind. I want to write my musical. But thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> Who's right here? Someone. Yes, right there. Uh huh. Okay, who is the youngest golden girl? I am. <laughs> Betty and Estelle were both born in, I think, 22. Uh, Betty was born in January and Estelle in July, I believe, June or July. I know she's six months younger than Betty. Um, B, I never did find out how old she is, but I think she's right in there with them. And I was born much later. <laughs> Read the book, I tell you how old I am. <laughs> oh, no, I, I was much younger. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your lifestyle and your diet and your exercise and all the wonderful things you're doing for yourself and your progress? Well, I'm a sort of. Um, uh, pseudo vegetarian. I eat fish because I'm on a I'm on a regimen that my my nutritionist has put me on, and he insists that I eat um, salmon and uh, sardines and any light fish, but no no tuna, no swordfish ever again as long as I live, because my mercury count went up and I had to cut it all out completely. So throw away those cans of tuna you've got. Tuna is a bad thing these days. And believe it or not, you can live without it. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. I've been living without it now for years. Um, I have a trainer who comes twice a week. I try to walk. You know, I have a treadmill and I have a new exercise cycle. And um, my son swears that the exercise cycle is the key. Because I have two torn meniscuses, one on each knee, and walking is tough. But he says an extra cycle will do it. Will build up the quads, you know, so that you, you're not ever going to have to have that um, surgery. And I'm not going to have that surgery. Oh no, no surgery. No more surgery if I can help it. Um, oh, I have little skin cancers removed, that kind of thing. But I'm not going to have any major surgery if I can help it. Oh, uh, what else do I do? What else do I do? Well, I, I eat a lot of vegetables, a lot of salad, a lot of greenery. I eat organic stuff, and I, I buy Fiji water. I read that it was the purest, and I believed them, and so on. You know. I just stayed at the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver on this book tour. They have an artesian well right there, 750 feet deep, and you can just drink the faucet water. 
You know, it was like going back to my childhood. It was heaven. They also bottle that water right down the street. But, I mean, I don't happen to have one in my backyard. <laughs> so I, I drink bottled water. Um, I can't have any dairy products of any sort. A lot of things that, that my doctors have taken me off of. But, you know, you'd be surprised. When you, when you get taken off, no red meat. Forget that. In fact, I'm not even supposed to have any white meat. Just no meat fish. But, you know, you get off of these things, and they used to be your, like, cottage cheese, love cottage cheese, yogurt, mm, yum, yum, can't have it anymore. Well, you find other things that are just as good, and you get used to it. I drink rice milk. I drink rice milk. I eat Rice Krispies as my cereal. I can have rice. I can't have any other. Well, I can have some others. I can have, however you pronounce that, quinoa, quinoa, quinoa. Quinoa. I can have that, I can have spelt, and I can have rice, and what's that other one, Kathy? What? C-A-M-U-T. K-A-M-U-T. Yeah, you know, breads and things made of these grains, but no wheat, no wheat, no rye, no uh, oats, no corn. Oh, I had to give up corn. But, so what? I can have beans, and I love beans. Beans and rice, nothing wrong with that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. My name is Antoinette. Hi. And I'm missing my daughter's sixth grade open house. And I don't have any You're missing it? Well, why don't you just run up the aisle and get out of here? <laughs> well, God bless her. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I better send her something. Yes, ma'am. I, I just want to see you because I'm an avid fan of yours. Raise your hand. Who's talking? Oh, you there. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All of these daughters are getting shunted around to the back. Yes, ma'am. Well, th tell her I said thank you. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a favorite Golden Girls episode? I have two. Oh, what are they? Uh, the two that I prefer, that I, I, I loved a, a lot of them. I love the one where I get to sing on top of the grand piano in the red dress. <laughs> I want to be loved by you. I thought that was so hilarious and so... You know, we choreographed it just precisely and learned it just precisely so that all those things that go wrong seem to be going wrong spontaneously. Well, it was a challenge, and I also just loved that whole show. Then I loved the one where we had a, a guest come to the house, a friend of Dorothy's, and she's staying with us. And Dorothy has given her, I think it's Sophia's bedroom, and um, after she's there about a day or two, um, I walk into Dorothy's bedroom, and there Sophia's in bed with Dorothy, and, and Betty's, I mean, uh, Rose is there, and they're talking. And I say, what are y'all talking about? And they said, well, we have learned that whatever her name is, Patricia, Katie, whatever her name is, is a lesbian. Jean? <laughs> Is there anybody here who doesn't know the rest of the dialogue? <laughs> I won't repeat it if you all already know it. <laughs> do, do you remember it? I say, a lesbian? Well, what's wrong with that? Danny Thomas is one. <laughs> and Dorothy says, not Lebanese. Lesbian. And, and Blanche says, Yes, lesbian. 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 
And she's shocked and outraged, and she starts to go out the door, and as she's about to go out the door, one of them says, and not only that, but she's got a crush on Rose. <laughs> and Blanche turns around and she says, Rose? Well, what's wrong with me? <laughs> that is such clever writing, you know? Those guys were so good. So those are my two favorites, just because they're so funny. Yes, ma'am. Did you guys add them a lot? Oh, honey, that is totally, uh, uh, you would be killed if you ad-libbed. Uh -huh. Shall I put it that way? Because the writers are competing for Emmys, just as the actresses are competing for Emmys. The writers are competing with their writing, and you say what they wrote the best you can. No, no ad-libbing. Besides, that would throw the rhythms off. You know, everything is strictly rehearsed. I think we're going to have time for one more, because I'm getting signals from the back that either that or we won't have time to sign any books. Yes, ma'am. You're an animal advocate. I am an animal advocate. Animal rights, absolutely. I am. I am, I am. And um, whereas Betty... Uh, loves animals. She tries to make it very clear she's not an animal rights advocate. But yeah, I am. I belong to several good societies. The PETA is certainly one of the main ones because they go through legal channels and they try to alleviate as much suffering and cruelty as possible. I will travel around and, you know, try to stop the horror. I have done so and will continue to do so. Thank you. And I think now we're going to sign.